As we continue our series in 1 John, let's turn together to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, and we'll look at verses 13 through 15. 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. Hear now God's Word. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that uh, we have the requests that we have asked of Him. So far, the reading from God's Word this evening. Well, there's uh, something in the the human experience, uh, doubt. And doubt, it can, it can sap all your motivation to move forward. Maybe you've, you've seen it when you've been driving around town. Somebody who thinks they can make it through an intersection, but then they realize halfway through that they're not sure, and, and what do they do? And they stop. They stop in the middle of the intersection, and, and confusion erupts. No, nobody goes anywhere, and the result of that is the fact that they're unsure of themselves. They don't know how to move forward. Doubt can be something that paralyzes us depending on our our personality. Sometimes people, uh, they get a mound of things that they have to get through and they are so unsure of of how to start that their response is to do nothing. The pile just stays there and sits there. It's because of doubt, because they are unsure as to how they should proceed. And so it can be in the Christian life too. Except there is one difference, of course, that Our knowledge, our faith, isn't one of skill and ability. Our knowledge and faith deals with salvation. And so what John does here in this passage before us this evening is draw our attention back that we would uh, rightly understand who God is, which will shape the way that we act towards Him. And so first, it's going to talk to us, this passage, about the assurance of belief, which we're going to see in verse 13. And then it's going to talk to us also about assurance specifically applied in the area of prayer. So if we believe what we ought to believe, what the Bible teaches us, that these things that John writes about in the beginning of our paragraph, if our faith is assured, then that will also spill over into our prayer lives. How we pray will also be from a position of assurance. So our assurance in belief is found in verse 13. And in verse 14 and 15, we're going to see assurance in prayer. So let's look first at the assurance in belief. As we begin looking at verse 13, we see the Apostle John writing something of a purpose statement for us, a purpose statement of the epistle, the first epistle of John. He is explaining why he is writing. And he says that he writes these things to those who believe so that you may know that you have eternal life. And so John is writing to the church, primarily to grant assurance of belief to them, that they can be certain in their knowledge about God. Now, this is not uh, the first time that John has said that he is writing these things to this particular group. He has done it several other occasions, beginning right at the beginning of the book. In chapter 1 and verse 4, he says he writes these things to make their joy complete. In chapter 2 and verse 1, he says that he writes these things to keep us from sinning. In chapter 2 and verse 26, he writes these things in order to describe the false teachers uh, to his church. And here in verse 13, as he draws his letter to a conclusion, he, he tells us why he has written. He has written so that the believer might have sure knowledge Now, this may not apply to all his readers, because we see uh, that John is writing these things to the one who believe, uh, the ones who believe in the name of the Son of God. So he is writing to those who are of the faith, somewhat like what we saw this morning in the letter of Jude. He wrote to the beloved. Here, John is writing to those who believe in the name of Jesus Christ. And so that excludes, of course, all those who don't believe. He has limited his audience and he is addressing them uh, directly. I want to consider a little bit what it means to believe in the name of the Son of God because 
Uh, to believe in the name of the Son of God is more than just to know His name. It's more than simply to recognize when the name Jesus is written down that we're dealing with somebody of that particular identity. But to believe in the name of Jesus Christ is to believe the testimony from God, what has just preceded. You remember from last week that testimony of water and blood and spirit that has gone before. And this is what we are to believe in as the people of God. This is not the first time that John has made that exhortation. If we look back in chapter 3 and verse 23, we see this written, and this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. And so it's almost an identical exhortation that John gives. It's identical not only in the final manifestation that he calls us to believe in the name of the Son of God, but it's also identical in that it follows a discussion on Christ's working salvation on behalf of his people. And so the background is the same and the actual statement is the same. As we reflect on what Christ has accomplished for us, we are to believe in the name of the Son. And so we are not to deny that the Son comes in the flesh. We are not to deny that the the Son comes as the anointed high priest of His people, signified by the water last week. We're not to deny that Christ uh, accomplished propitiation for us, that He uh, took on Himself the wrath of God, that we would be pleasing in God's sight again, that He would offer Himself as our sacrifice, the, the perfect sacrificial Passover lamb. We're not to deny these things. And that's what John says as he writes to the professing Christian. That's different from what he is hoping to accomplish in his gospel. We have referred back to John's gospel many times to gain an understanding of what he's writing about in his letter. But in his gospel, he is trying to accomplish something quite differently. And in John chapter 20, verse 30 and, and 31, uh, he has written down for us a summary statement of, of why he has uh, written his gospel. And he is following up after writing many of the signs that Christ accomplished. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So what's he trying to accomplish in his gospel? It is an evangelistic writing hoping to accomplish the change of heart within a sinful person, uh, that they would change from an unbeliever into, an, into a believer, and that through that faith they would have life. And the letter of 1 John is, is somewhat different. He is writing, assuming that that change has already taken place. He is assuming that we do have life in Christ. And now he is only writing that we would have Assurance that we would grow in our certainty of our salvation. Now, what's uh, important to notice is that this growth in certainty is not certain. And that's what John is saying to us. When he writes to these people, he is writing hoping to increase their assurance, hoping to increase the certainty of their faith. And so we have to go back to grammar school a little bit to understand what John exactly is saying and, and how he's saying it. Because much of what we say from day to day is a, is a statement of fact. It's, uh, we're asserting something to be certain, something to be true, something uh, that is, without a doubt, uh, communication of, of a fact. Your jacket, your jacket is blue. Well, that is a statement of fact. There's no question about it. That is simply an observation of what is. But what John is doing here, and we see it, by the introduction of a very small word, here he is dealing with something that is not certain. He is dealing with the realm of possibility. And you can see it in verse 13 when he says uh, that he is writing these things to, the, to those who believe in, in Christ, that you may know that you have eternal life. It is in, uh, in the Greek language, it's in the subjunctive mood, meaning that it's not something of a communication of fact. It's a communication of possibility. And so what John is saying is, if you pay attention to these things, you will grow in your certainty. But what's the flip side of it? 
The flip side is, if you don't pay attention to these things, you won't grow in your certainty of what God has accomplished. So John is urging us to pay attention to his words that we will grow in this knowledge of life that we have through Christ Jesus. And the flip side is that by neglecting these words, we would not. That's one of the reasons why it is so important for us to give uh, diligent attention to uh, the attendance of the worship services, morning and evening, and that we would not neglect the words as we were urged this morning, but that we, by hearing the words proclaimed again, that we would grow in our certainty, and that we would understand more clearly the promises of God on display for us. And this confidence that, that John is trying to cultivate, this certainty that he is seeking to develop in the people of God, is often called assurance uh, uh, from a theological perspective. It speaks of the certainty of our faith in Christ. And that has been John's purpose throughout most of the book. Uh, John has used the language of assurance as he has moved his way through this letter. He wants his readers to know certainly that they are reborn. He uses this language of assurance, for example, in chapter 2 and verse 3, we know that we have come to know him. In chapter 3 and verse 14, we know we have passed from death to life. In chapter 3, verse 19, we shall know we are of the truth. In verse 21, we have confidence before God. In chapter 4 and verse 13, we know we abide in Him. Knowing, confidence, it's the language of certainty. It's the language of assurance. And you can uh, determine that for yourself because you answer questions based on certainty all the time. If somebody asks you a question and you're not exactly sure what the answer is, what do you say? I don't know. But if a question is asked in a group, especially a, a group of enthusiastic young children, and they're maybe they're in a classroom setting, so they have to raise their hand, and, and the teacher asks the question, what's two plus two? Oh, I know, I know. There's a certainty there. There is a certainty, and that is the equivalent of knowledge. When we say we know, that means we are certain. And John wants certainty for the people of God regarding eternal life. Now, the problem, of course, is that this assurance doesn't always belong to the believer. We saw it a little bit this morning. We saw how we can be convicted by our lack of faithfulness to the Word of God. And so sometimes... Uh, in our Christian walk, uh, we are not assured. And here too, John is seeking to help them grow in assurance. If the, those who believed in the name of God did not need growth in this area, uh, John wouldn't be writing this part of his letter, would he? But he knows that the people of God do need assurance. They do need to be built up in their faith. And so John is addressing them here for that particular purpose. Assurance, of course, is not necessary for salvation. It is not part of the order of salvation. Uh, you, can, uh, you cannot be born again without being regenerated. You cannot be called a Christian without being justified by God. You cannot be uh, called a Christian without sanctification being part of your life. But you can be a Christian and doubt you can be a Christian and doubt that you have eternal life. You can be a Christian and lack in the area of assurance. And perhaps that's something that all of us have experienced from time to time. Because there are different times when we can be driven to doubt by our failures. We may fail to contend for the faith. More than that, we might fail to contend for the faith quite willingly. We might fail to contend for the faith quite joyfully. We might fail to contend for the faith quite habitually. And in those moments when we recognize our failures, that is when we ask ourselves the question, how can I do these things and still be one of the children of God? So the question that John is trying to answer for us is, how do I gain this assurance? Is there a magic pill, perhaps, that we could take? Maybe we could run down to Walgreens and get something over the counter even if we have to pay a little bit for it. 
that we would have this assurance. But there is uh, no magic pill. For some believers, it will take years to grow in assurance before they have any kind of certainty that they are born again, that they are regenerated. For others, this process will take less time. But John here gives us uh, the solution as to how we may grow in our assurance. And it is simply that of belief. Uh, he has urged us prior that uh, when we have faith in Christ, as we saw in his gospel, that we have life in his name. Uh, the source of our doubt uh, is opposed by the work of Christ. When we recognize Christ and his standing, what he has accomplished for us, uh, our doubt fades away. Because what are we doing when we have doubt of our salvation? Who are we looking at? We're looking at ourselves. We're looking what we have done. We're looking at how we have performed in the presence of a righteous and holy God. But when we have assurance, who are we thinking of? We're thinking of Christ. We're thinking of our high priest. We're thinking of the one who sacrificed himself for us on the cross, that if we would believe in him, that we would have life in his name. So the Son of God come in the flesh. He is the solution to our doubt, the solution to our lack of assurance. So we have to ask ourselves, where do we learn of God's grace? Well, that's what John is trying to address to us. He writes these things to us. He has written this letter in the New Testament that we would have assurance. As we reflect on the Word of God, we have assurance in Christ. But there are other ways that we can gain assurance. We see God's grace communicated, it, communicated to us regularly in word and prayer and sacrament. All of these point us not to our failures as man, they all point us to how man is reconciled to a long-suffering and patient God. We are reminded that it is not by works that we come into God's presence when we consider our great high priest. That we come only because of his gracious gift to us. We are reminded, for example, in Romans chapter 8, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It takes away our doubt. We are reminded from John's Gospel that, cry, that Christ cried out, It is finished. It's finished. Christ is our mediator. Christ is our surety. And Christ is the foundation of our assurance. Christ is the one who gives us faith that we would know for sure that we have life in His name. That is what the Word tells us. That is what the sacraments display. And it's what prayer acknowledges. When we use these, we grow in our assurance because we will think little of ourselves and we will think much of Christ. So, John lays that out for us. First of all, the certainty that comes to us through our faith. When we grow certain of God's promises, something else happens. When we grow certain of God's promises, it will affect the way that we act. And John takes time to address specifically uh, it will the, the effect that this assurance have, has on the way that we address God in prayer. And so if we look down to verse 14, we, we see that Christian theology is never just a mental game. It's another, never just gymnastics that we do in our head. Uh, Christian theology always results in action. It always has a consequence. And so here uh, we see that, that John is laying out for us that assurance will result in a difference in prayer. But there are different ways that assurance have, ha has worked in, in the lives of people. It is assurance of God's promises that allowed the Apostle Paul to stand before the governors of his day and, and proclaim the gospel to them without fear. It is assurance that allowed uh, the Apostle Peter, once a, a denier of Christ, now to stand and, and proclaim him, proclaim the resurrection of Christ despite opposition 
from his own people and from the rulers of his people. It is assurance that made men like Athanasius endure banishment after banishment, standing firm on the promises of the gospel. It is assurance that made men like Martin Luther stand before the rulers of the church and say, here I stand, I can do no other. It is an assurance of the promise of God that causes us to walk, to stand, to speak with conviction. And so John takes this assurance and, and he applies it specifically to prayer. And he says that if we are confident in our assurance, uh, that we are also confident in prayer. We will stand before God without fear. Uh, it is assurance that allows us to do that. You understand. When we reflect on our sins, our shortcomings, our first reaction is to do as Adam and Eve did, to flee from God to hide themselves from God. But for the Christian, assured of the promise, something is different. We stand before the God who by rights would judge us, and we say, Father, Father. We speak to Him confidently, without fear, because He is the one who has purchased us. We stand before Him confidently because we know that our sin has not changed our standing in His sight. Our sin has not changed our, our standing just as much as our works of righteousness have not changed our standing. Now, our sins, they may grieve God. Our sins may cause us to wander in darkness. They may cause us to grope around as we rely on our, ourselves. But if we are of the family of God, our actions will never cast us, uh, cast us out from His presence. You can think of that in, in your own, perhaps it's in your own painful memories of, of your childhood, or maybe you're, you're working as parents. You bring correction into your children's lives because of the way that they act. But do you ever take your little three-year-old after, after he's stolen another cookie, can't believe he's done it again, and you pack up his little knapsack and you stick him out on the front porch and you lock the door? You don't do that. You don't cast them out. You discipline them. But their actions never, ever, ever change their identity. They are still members of your family. And so that's how we come to God in prayer. We come like the little ones who we have disciplined. You know the little ones when they're really small. When they're older, they do it in different ways. But when they're really small and you've just had to administer a consequence to them, they know that you love them. Because how do they turn? They return. They put up their hands. They want mom and dad to pick them up. That is the assurance that we have in the presence of God. We know that He has not cast us out because we know that our actions have not brought us into His presence, and He has promised us that our actions will not cast us out from His presence. And so we come in prayer, but we don't only come in prayer asking whatever we want. When we understand the promises of God, we come asking for things, it says in our passage, for things according to His will. And when we ask that way, we have assurance, we have confidence. It says in verse 14 that... He hears us. It may seem odd to say it that way, that we have to ask for things according to His will. If we are to ask for things according to His will, why, why bother, we might, we might think. But it's a beautiful statement. Because what are things according to God's will? That the sins of His children would be forgiven that He would be glorified in our lives, that we would learn to love Him more, that we would learn to serve Him better, that we would be joyful in the obedience of all His commandments, that we would learn to hate sin, that we would rest on Him alone for salvation, that we would speak the truth of His, His Word boldly, that we would worry less, that we would be content in our infirmities. Read His Word. 
You'll see His will on display there. But ask ourselves, do we often pray for things according to God's will? We pray maybe for a, a better job, a better paying job. Or we pray for deliverance from hardship. Or we pray for forgiveness, but not hatred of sin. We want to be forgiven, but we don't want to hate sin. Or we pray for protection from the world. I'm not saying that it is necessarily wrong to pray for these things, but we do not know if these are things according to God's will. We do not know if He would have us have a better paying job. I think all of us on the male side of, the, of humanity, we've all prayed for our favorite team to win something, right? We don't know if that is God's will. We are to pray, John says, for things according to God's will. And that when we pray those things, that we can be certain of Him hearing us. Think of the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6 verses 9 through 13. If we think of the content of the Lord's Prayer and, and we work our way all the way through that prayer, what are we praying for? The first petition, we're, we're praying for God's glory. Hallowed be thy name. In the second petition, thy kingdom come, we're, we're praying for God's rule. Thy will be done. We're praying for God's direction. Give us this day our daily bread. We're praying for God's provision. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We're praying for God's forgiveness. And lead us not into temptation. We're praying for God's deliverance. That prayer, that entire prayer, is based around God's will being and so we remember that when we come to Him in prayer. We ask that way, remembering that we are addressing our priest, remembering that we are addressing the perfect Passover lamb. And when we speak that way, we can be sure, we can be certain that He hears us, as certain as we can be of our salvation, that He has bought us with a price. It flows from us knowing whom we are addressing. And it flows from understanding His love towards us as fallen and sinful people. So John writes tonight. He writes to assure us. He writes to give us certainty of belief. And that certainty of belief will lead to confidence also in practice, specifically in the area of prayer. When we know who Christ is, we will only desire things that are according to His will. It is when we think of self, it is when we ask for self, it is then that we wallow in the misery of life apart from God's favor. Let's pray together.